The thoughts, opinions, and general overall shades thrown on Hyatt 9 News are those of the individual speakers and not those of Hyatt 9 News, its audience, or its advertisers. The statements made do not constitute medical, legal, or financial advice. And for advice tailored to your specific situation, please consult with a licensed professional. Welcome to the Hyatt 9 News Hour, where you will hear from cannabis industry experts and professionals from around the country talk about important topics while shining light on global issues and discussing cannabis as it relates to politics, regulation and reform, data and technology, science, research and medicine, family and parenting, art, celebrities and entertainment, fitness, sports, mental health and wellness, and plant-based medicines and entheogenics. Together, we are building a stronger community, fighting the stigma and creating change. With your hosts, Jason Beck and Rico Lamite, joined by special industry expert correspondents from around the country and daily antics brought to you by Cannabis. Coming to you live every Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time and high noon on the East Coast. And thank you all for getting high at 9 with us. Oh, yeah. Good morning, everybody. That's right. It is Wednesday, April 3rd, and today is National Film Score Day. National Find a Rainbow Day, because everyone's looking for that pot of gold. Child Help National Day of Hope. Save the children. That's right. Save the children. Save the children, Rico. You're right about that. Rico, it's also National Chocolate Moose Day. Save the mooses. Mm -hmm. They used to call they used to call me chocolate moose back in the day. Oh Sorry. boy! Oh, yeah, I was man. like, damn, why is that one directed at Rico? <laughs> <laughs> National Walking Day, so make sure you get your steps in today. And it is also National Tweed Day. Make sure you get some tweed in your life. Thank you all for joining us and getting high at nine with us. It's also high noon on the East Coast. And please remember to like, share, and subscribe to us on all social media platforms. You can look up above on your screen to see exactly where we live on the Internet. And we are live every Monday through Friday on YouTube, Rumble, Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and on our very own website at www.highatnightnews.com. But kicking it off first, we are going to move right on into the dope dad himself making an amazing appearance today because he obviously got some shit done yesterday. That's right, it is the dope dad himself, Mr. Rico Lameet. Oh, yeah, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, yesterday was uh, very, very, very dramatic. Mm. But um, thank you for your patience and your grace. Of course, bro. We got you. And um, today I want to talk a little bit about sobriety, right? So 24 years ago, a group of young, drug-fueled, amateur stuntmen... Uh, became a became a cultural phenomenon uh, with mainstream launch of their over the top reality style um, excuse me reality TV style skit show on MTV. Mm -hmm. What'd you do, Rico? Who is calling out others in media for fueling America's addiction problems by glorifying and normalizing cannabis consumption? Does Steve-O have a point? Steven Steve-O Glover is now 16 years sober after multiple stints in rehab and being forced into having years of his own struggle with addiction being widely publicized and played out for millions of fans uh, and critics to see on television. Per the reporting of Fox News' Gabriel Hayes, Glover says that he backed out of an episode of Bill Maher's Club Random podcast on HBO after the host refused to promise to refrain from smoking during the show. Steve-O said on a recent episode of Wild Ride, of his Wild Ride podcast, that Mar told him that it would be a deal breaker to interview him while not being able to smoke a joint. Steve-O said that he found it kind of upsetting after the actor and stuntman has been sober for 16 years after struggling with addiction. Here's what he said. I'm a clean and sober guy. It's very important that I maintain my sobriety as it's approaching 16 years. I'm about to be sweet 16. Really, there's nothing I value more than my sobriety. There's nothing more that I protect than my recovery. He criticized the pot friendly host saying that I found it kind of upsetting while, uh, or when the Bill Maher podcast reached out and he smokes pot the whole time while he interviews people. 
I said, I'd happily go on there, but while I'm on, out of respect for my sobriety, could he refrain from smoking pot? He said no, and that it's a deal breaker. Per the article, Marr often smokes marijuana while speaking to his high-profile guests on the show. He has been uh, for the legalization of cannabis for years and has claimed the drug helps him with his writing for his HBO show. In a 2016 interview with the Chicago Tribune, Marr said that um, he's hardly the only person in this world who finds pot to be a creative aid. But if I'm staring at the blank computer screen sober, I'm thinking, uh, I don't want to start this. It's an assignment. Then as soon as I'm high, which takes about three seconds, it's, oh, this is fun. This is an assignment. It's a game. The Jackass star mentioned the frustration that he felt Mark couldn't uh, accommodate him when the other podcast hosts who smoke pot on their programs have done so. Mike Tyson's podcast is called Hot Boxing, Steve-O said. Be real. All of these prolific potheads have been on their shows, and it wasn't so important to them to blow marijuana smoke in my face. But for Bill Maher, it was a deal breaker. Hay said that Maher has reportedly uh, refrained from smoking during the podcast before. According to Entertainment Weekly, the club random host did not smoke while talking to his guest musician, Sheryl Crow. During the episode, he jokingly asked Crow if he could at least hold a joint. As someone who struggled with addiction myself, um, I finally, you know, I, I personally have no issue with respecting any guest's wishes for me to refrain from dangling one of their vices in their faces. Uh, while weed was the catalyst uh, to, to, to drag me out of my hole, and um, I do respect Mars' creative process. It's just ain't it, man. Um, I think it's yet another bad look for Mar, uh, for Bill Mar, who's no stranger to cringe-worthy moves and comments over the years. And I don't care how much of a cannabis advocate you are, or how big your platform is. Using a recovery, a recovering addict's wish to not be around weed smoke as leverage to get him on the show is the kind of tone-deaf activism that the world could do better without. Um, those are just my thoughts on the situation. Big shout out to Steve-O for refusing to take the bait and congrats on Sweet 16 of sobriety. I'm Rico Lamit, the dopest dad on the street for Hide 9 News. Love to hear what the rest of the team thinks about this one. Bro, I'll um, oh, go ahead, Luke, go ahead. I, th I think this might be the first time that I've ever disagreed with Rico on the show. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. It, and this is, this, is where, this, is where, this is what I'm equating this to, like, Blur. I wouldn't go on Bob Marley's show and tell Bob Marley not to smoke weed when I was there, no matter what I was going through. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's Bob Marley's thing, right? That's Bob Marley's space. So like, I, for Steve-O, like, listen, I respect that. I respect his recovery. I respect that he's living an awesome, better life now and all of those things. Right. But I'm not going to bring my challenges because that's ultimately what that is. Because some people can have addictions and be around cannabis and have no problem with it at all. Mm -hmm. But other people have challenges with that. So because you have those challenges and all those things going on internally, you want me to change the creative atmosphere and my lifestyle and what I have going on at this podcast for this singular guest. That's the part that I disagree with. I like yeah i i agree with i agree with luke on this and uh, i myself am uh coming up on four, 14 years clean from from opiates um so i'm no i'm no stranger to the recovery process and addiction itself but i i agree first of all I, I agree with rico but this isn't about holding bill maher up as some example of, of somebody that's cool or anything because he's cringe all on his own and and that's a whole separate discussion but to your point luke you know, this is this is his space, his creative space, where he has guests on. It's well documented that he regularly smokes cannabis on that show. And just as Steve-O has the right to refuse to put himself in that position, Bill Maher has the right to say, okay, that's fine. Then you're not going to be a guest on my show because this is part of the process. But I think at a higher level, I think this speaks, at least in my opinion, of the flaws that I see with the 12-step all-or-nothing sobriety process i've never been a fan of that i didn't go through it myself because i didn't agree with the process i know that it works for some people so i'm not trying to discount that if it helps people stay sober that's great for them but i think this is where it turns into a slippery slope where people expect others to change their behavior patterns 
in order mm -hmm. to comply with with their own sobriety right like my <clears throat> yeah. my question is would steve-o go to an after party for some hollywood event and insist that they don't serve alcohol there well, right. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. yeah that... I think it's a little bit different in this situation because is Steve-O asking to be on this show? Did he seek no. Bill Maher out and say, "Hey, bro, put me on your show," or was it the other way around? It was the other if way. If Bill around. Maher is the one approaching, if it's his staff that's saying, "Hey, Steve-O, we know you're sober, but hey, come on our show. It's cool. Go ahead and feel uncomfortable. Go ahead and be a little bit annoyed when you're on our show. It's fine. Our host matters more than you do. Fuck that." That's hella rude. You don't ask somebody to come into your home and invite them over knowing that they are diabetic or celiacs or whatever and feed them what the fuck ever. You respect that peace in that space that you invited them to. You create to a situation where that you're inviting someone to host. So you need to act accordingly. I, I, I don't but know. He's not forcing him to smoke I, though. It's not like he's being fed food. Well, this, 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 is ahead, my thing. This, this is my thing on this. I think Steve-O is being a big, big baby about about all of this. Now, I totally respect his his wanting to be sober and everything else like that. And and it's like if you don't if you want to maintain your sobriety, then you do you make certain lifestyle changes to make sure that you are accommodating to to your own needs to make sure that you don't put yourself in those types of situations. And well, by, he is. And and well, no, 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 no. But by well, even, but no, no, but hold. Hold on a sec. No, no. Hold on a second. Everybody knows that people that 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 Bill smokes on the show, and so even if Bill Maher is asking him, "Hey, Steve-O, you want to be on the show?" Steve-O's answer should have been at the at the Jump Street should have been, no. "Oh no, no, I don't want to do it, bro, because I'm not comfortable with you smoking cannabis around me." I can't handle those situations. Exa exactly, exactly. I'm and, and, and it should have been. I can't handle these situations. Yeah, I and on, on top of that, there's a lot of people that used cannabis as an exit drug so they're like i don't think it's a fair assumption that just because somebody says that they're sober for anybody to assume that they don't right. smoke cannabis i i, I well, agree with that unless, too. unless I, bill knew that beforehand it was for I mean, me listen steve is very fact. transparent about his yeah. sobriety he's a hardcore no on everything mm -hmm. that's been yeah, in the and, media and, for a very long time so to go and approach somebody who takes that kind of stance publicly yeah but now now you're assuming that they know that they say hey I don't really want to be around that for the one hour or however long the interview is like it's it's just but kind that, of like a slap in the face in a way I feel and like I get it. Bill Maher, i'm not done Bill Maher, <laughs> Bill Maher does, this is his mo on his show this is his thing mm -hmm. right he can go ahead and have whatever he wants on his show but you have to like Acknowledge the elephant in the room when you're asking a guest to come on your show that you know has this situation. It's a respect thing. How do you know that they Otherwise, knew that, Mandy? Just an arrogant talk show host. How do you, how do you know that they knew that? Hey, hold on. Hey, 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 you're, you're assuming you're, 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 that, 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 that that's an assumption that people are really the show. The show doesn't know that Steve-O has challenges being around cannabis. Exactly. There's plenty of I'm people, as Phil exactly. Hum just gave an example, that can be around cannabis and have had past addictions that have no problem. So when I reach out to Steve-O, hey, I don't know what kind of mental like challenges he has with being around oranges or the color purple or anything like that. Like I don't know those things. So all Steve-O has to say is, hey, respectfully, Bill Maher, I don't want to be on the show because I know that you smoke. I'm not going to go ask Snoop Dogg not to smoke on his show that's exactly. just ridiculous exactly to me. i i i, I uh, totally uh, agree uh, so, so, so two things two two things here mandy mandy i'm with you it was you. a poor matchup from the jump it, 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 mandy i'm with you like 100 like uh, uh, on your stance here so two things number one bill maher refrained from smoking for cheryl crow to come on the show uh, but that was two, his choice. that was his choice exactly uh, was that? He that didn't. Was his choice. Like, Steve-O is making him not smoke. Bill no, Maher chose no, 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 not to no, no, smoke. He respected that shit. Oh, he said, hey, God. look, Cheryl Crow, yeah, like, I'm not going to smoke just because I want you on it. Cheryl Crow's team had the same request as Steve-O's, and he complied for, for Cheryl Crow. He made the request, Wait, uh, and they knew maybe they that have this a different was, relationship. Uh, this was go. his stipulation, and that's his prerogative. It's yeah, his show. it's his show. It's his yeah. show. He can do whatever the hell he that's wants. Like, uh, this is poor execution on the parts of the people Agreed. who are producing this show and planning it. Yeah, again, again, fuck, fuck Bill Maher. Should have sorted this out before it got started. 
Yeah, Bill Maher's a weirdo anyway, so I don't want this to to come across as like I'm I'm like his his big well, defender be here because I don't I don't like him. Yeah, you don't but, like Bill Maher? Absolutely. Not. I can't believe <laughs> that. Crash, dude. After crash. yeah, no, I, I mean I don't know. Maybe this is just my own my own no, recovery listen. path. But like after 16 years, if you can't even be in the room with another substance, like I don't know, like. I, I do find that to be a little bit interesting. It's yeah, not like I mean, Bill Maher is on the I, show over there smoking you. meth and, out of out of a meth pipe. Like, right, come on. right. He's not banging heroin sure. on the side of the show. Yeah, exa exactly. It's I, extreme, sure, if, but it, it, it's it, not. It, it's just something that should have been sorted out in advance. I, I, I agree. It with seems that. like a bit of a power move on Steve-O's part too. It, it seems like a power move on both of them. Both I feel, of them I feel wanted like, the other person to fold. Yeah, I feel like Steve-O is, is grandstanding and trying to trying to use this whole situation to get his name back in the media and the spotlight and whatnot. Because I'll tell you what, I haven't heard his, I haven't heard of Steve-O he, he, he since said, he, he was on. He, was, he said he was on two other. Uh, he was on two other okay. uh, weed podcasts. Steve-O is doing and, and fine, it. folks. He's had his own TV series yeah. for a very long time don't think for one minute that he's not wealthy for a lifetime off of jackass i mean he yeah. might have spent all that money on meth we don't know oh <laughs> you know what and on that we're gonna go to a commercial we're gonna be right back uh, oh man that was weird hey you america that looks like sean connery <laughs> Good morning, America. Saman Razani coming to you live from sunny Los Angeles, California with the one and only highest host, Mr. Jason Beck, smoking on the best weed in the world. Did you know that we have an audio-only version of our podcast? You can find it on Apple, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. No excuses in 2024. If you haven't checked us out, check it out now. And also, check out what The Prophet's doing in 2024. Because you guys were having too much fun. Oh, we're back. <laughs> we're back. Mm -hmm. We are back clear in the once again. And next we have the Hyatt 9 News head honcho, known for smoking the best weed in the world, the highest Republican in every room, and the man who does not care about you or your feelings. That's we got right. Mike Lee in the house? Oh, you're definitely doesn't care about Steve-O's feelings. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely don't care about Steve-O's feelings. Jason Beck. Oh, yeah. Good morning. Good morning, you guys. All right. All right, Dale, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about this. And this is a follow-up story on a story that we have uh, been following here at Hyatt 9 News because conflicting views of history emerge as U.S. opposes Warren D.A. in the medical marijuana suit, you guys. Oh, yeah, here we go. The Warren County District Attorney's Office attempt to overhaul the federal regulation of marijuana and firearms is becoming a debate over history as much of it is a battle over drug policy and the Second Amendment. In responding to Rob Green's lawsuit filed in federal court in Erie, the U.S. Justice Department is contending that Green has no foundation in the law or history as he argues that users of medical marijuana like him should be allowed to have firearms despite the federal pro prohibition otherwise. Green said history and the Constitution favor him when he uh, sued in January and filed a request for a preliminary injunction in March. And quote says, history is devoid of any laws demonstrating a tradition of disarming individuals for using particular kind of medicine, such as cannabis, according to Green's brief for a preliminary injunction. History does not support this total bar on the right to keep and bear arms, according to the brief, which refers to the language of the Second Amendment. In a brief filed on Monday, the Justice Department responded by arguing that the Second Amendment applies to law-abiding citizens and that the amendment has never prevented Congress from prohibiting unlawful users of controlled substances from possessing firearms, prohibitions codified in the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968. As long as the federal government continues to list marijuana as an illegal narcotic, holders of medical marijuana cards, even if Pennsylvania and other states have legalized medical marijuana, uh, violate federal law if they possess guns, according to the Justice Department's brief. And the department's lawyer, Jeremy S.B. Newman, said in a brief that history supports the federal government. In quotes, he says, disarming unlawful drug users is consistent with the historical tradi tradition of restricting firearms possession and use on the basis of intoxicating and the historical tradition of disarming groups of people who would present a danger with firearms, according to the brief. 
Uh, Green's case is before the U.S. District Court. Kathy uh, Bassoon, who is based in Pittsburgh, but hears cases in the Erie Division of the Pittsburgh-based U.S. District Court of the Washington District of Pennsylvania. No hearing date has been sent. And in a quote from the U.S. Department lawyer Jeremy S.B. Newman says, uh, disarming unlawful drug users is consistent with the historical tradition of restricting firearms possession and use on the basis of intoxicating and the historical tradition of disarming groups of people who would present a danger with firearms. Green is the lead plaintiff as he as he sues with help from another plaintiff, the Washington uh, State-based Second Amendment Foundation. They are suing the United States government, Attorney General Merrick Garland, and the directors of the FBI and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives. The plaintiff wants Bassoon to set aside the federal law that, that bars users of medical marijuana from possessing firearms. The plaintiffs also want Bassoon to grant a preliminary injunction to temporarily ban enforcement of the law while she considers the underlying lawsuit. The case is believed to be the first of its kind in the United States. A win for Green would have a sweeping effect in Pennsylvania, one out of thir- one of 38 states to legalize medical cannabis, and a state where half a million people have medical marijuana cards, according to Green's court filings. Green, a Republican, was first elected in 2013 a district attorney of the largely rural 38,000 resident Warren County. He said in late December that he would not seek re-election after his current term expires in 2025 so he could focus on advocating for legalization and regulation of marijuana. Green's lawsuit followed on uh, January 23rd. He said in the suit that that he has refrained from possessing firearms since he got a Pennsylvania medical marijuana card in May 2023. The suit and other case documents do not detail Green's medical condition and the legal conflict at the core of Green's case exists because marijuana is not legal nationwide despite legalization of medical marijuana at some state levels. Marijuana, uh, we know all of that, you guys. Uh, Green is taking uh, up his challenge as the U.S. Supreme Court has shifted its approach to the Second Amendment rights Key to the strategy of Green and his lawyers, including the Second Amendment Foundation's executive director, Adam Kraut, uh, is the reliance on the Supreme Court's 2022 landmark ruling in the case of New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, uh, ETL versus Bruin. Uh, in a 6-3 to three decision, the Supreme Court in the Bruin case changed the standards for evaluating the, cons- the constitutionality of gun control measures in holding that the Second Amendment protects the ability of law-abiding citizens to carry firearms in public. History must drive the review of gun restrictions, and Justice Clarence Thomas said in the majority opinion. In quotes, to justify its regulation, the government may not simply p- uh, pose it that the regulation promotes an important interest, according to the majority opinion. Rather, the government must demonstrate that the regulation is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. That standard is what has led Green and the Justice Department to invoke history as they establish their positions in the U.S. District Court in Erie. Well, 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 you guys. Man, oh, man, oh, man. I feel like this is going to be a good day. Once this verdict comes out for cannabis and gun-toting cannabis lovers who love to toke and fire up in all different forms of ways. And this is Jason Beck for the High at Nine News. What do y'all have to say about this? I think the federal government's Token on a slippery, slippery slope here, Jason. I think it is. I think hey, I agree with you, Dale. I think they're going to lose the, this uh, case. The standard that was set by the Supreme Court in that New York uh, carry mm-hmm. case, mm-hmm. Bruin case, whatever you're talking about there, yep. it added an extra layer. And our nation started in 1789, and it wasn't until, geez, the 1960s or 70s that they finally decided to make uh, possession of illegal drugs a way to stop people from having guns. Mm-hmm. So if you add that layer onto the test, then I don't know how they win this because cannabis or marijuana was – wasn't illegal federally till 1937, and it wasn't until, you know, the 60s or 70s decided to make it something that restricts you from having a gun. Now, this is very important to all the vets that I represent out there that have PTSD, like smoking weed, mm-hmm. because they're concerned that if anybody finds out, they're going to lose their gun rights. So they're watching this very carefully. Um, I just, I just think the federal government's blowing smoke up everybody's ass. They don't want to lose this. But I don't know that they have a decent argument based upon the Supreme Court standard that was just set. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, their argument is trash, Dale. Their argument is like, 
it, by the standard becoming that, I forget Thomas's direct quote of history must drive gun regulation or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The way the, the, the green is right. Green is green. The plaintiff green here is 100% right because the, there is no historical context for it. And the historical context that the government tries to use here is when people in the Wild West were disarmed for being intoxicated and they used to have like local rules and laws and stuff like that. That's completely different. If some dude is incapacitated and just falling out drunk with firearms in his hands, that's a totally different situation mm -hmm. of why we're disarming that person rather than somebody that has to use a medicinal herbs. let's also clarify that there. too though luke like let's clarify what yeah. disarming in the wild west meant too right those first right. open carry bans existed in wild west towns like deadwood but you know how they worked when you were in the town limits if you were drunk sheriff would come and take your pistol we went into a saloon you hand your pistol to the bartender and guess what when you leave they give back. you your gun back it was not a permanent disarmament of people that because they were intoxicated or incapacitated it was them saying that while you're out here drinking moonshine and drinking whiskey you can't be strapped which is probably a reasonable thing to say but it wasn't like well, you can never you can never handle a firearm again because you got drunk once at a saloon let me also point out that when you got released from prison they gave you back your guns too mm -hmm. and that was up through the 19th century they didn't start taking your guns away for real after you were convicted until into the 20th century so a lot of this i mean i don't want someone who's a violent criminal having his guns back i think there are some things we can talk about here someone who smokes weed not being able to have guns that's just that's blow that's pulling shit right out of your ass that's mm -hmm. crazy yeah, no, I I, I, I agree, Dill. I, I think I, I think that uh, I, I think Green is going to score a big win for all of freedom loving uh, cannabis consumers across the country, and I think this is going to have rippling effects that uh, that that we are all going to be able to benefit from, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, man. Yeah, and on that, you we're be able to tote while you tote. That's right. That's right. You know, bang, bang, bang. You know what I mean? Bang, bang. You know, real, bang, bang. real, real, real firepower. You know what I'm saying? All that good stuff. Responsible, responsible. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm I'm all for responsible, responsible use. And coming up next, that's right. He's an attorney of law and the founder of Armada Law Practice. And at one point in time, he did some time for a cannabis crime. That's right. Is none other than Mr. Attorney showing the chest hair today, Mr. Dale Schaefer. <laughs> Damn, taco meat the, the, lady, the ladies are jumping for joy to get the first oh, yeah. chance to puke in the toilet. Okay. Oh, man. Hey, guys. Magic. Good, good morning. My story this morning, I, and I, I got laryngitis over the weekend, so I'm still a little bit hoarse here. My story this morning in, involves a pissing match between the tobacco company uh, that holds a trademark for Raw and the cannabis company that has a trying to get a trademark for Raw Gardens. And BBC is the cannabis company, though. I mean, the tobacco company that has raw, and they sell rolling papers and trays and rolling machines and machines to shred up tobacco and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of people buy raw rolling papers in the cannabis industry, and they kind of sort of, you know, advertise that direction. Well, um, raw filed a suit against. Uh, um, yeah, um, the CCA is the name of this company, and they're, um, they they said you're infringing on our our trademark here for um, for raw, okay? And the court took a look at it and said, well, I don't think there's any confusion here between these two trademarks. Uh, so the court dismissed the case against uh, CCA uh, for for the claim they were infringing on Raw's trademark. But then uh, they also took a look at Raw Gardens and said, well, look, you guys uh, are being attacked by or opposed by someone who has a registered trademark for Raw. Okay. And you have four applications pending at the trademark office. So we're going to take a look at all of those applications. And this is where many of my friends in the trademark uh, line got a little upset, and then they they said, "Well, I I'm not sure that we like them doing that because there's an entire process at the trademark office where you file an application. You're supposed to tell them 
whether this is first use or whether you're intended to commercially use it. And it seems that raw gardens didn't check that box. They didn't say, well, we intend to use this commercially. So rather than wait until the patent and trade trial office had litigated this, decided they were going to give you a trademark or, or dismiss it, the court stepped in and dismissed all these trademark applications. Now, I, I'm not sure that um, I understand all the import of this. And I've said before, that if you have a trademark issue, you need to get a trademark specialist because there are apparently jurisdictions in this this country, the federal jurisdictions, these are the, the, tri the uh, trial courts and the appellate courts don't allow a district court to take a look at what's pending before the patent and trade office. But it seems that there are that allow this. So this is going to probably have to make its way up to the Supreme Court to see if, if challenging a trademark is going to allow the court to take every application before the trademark office and take a look at it in their trial court and then decide if they're going to dismiss them all. Now, one of the, the takeaways from this, and I'm going to say this again, that if you are going to have a trademark for your cannabis business, you can only register them for cannabis statewide. But I, I know um, cannabis, I mean, I know trademark attorneys that do cannabis go to the Patent and Trademark Office and they'll register trademarks for a lot of other merchandise. That's not cannabis merchandise, but that there are trademarks out there. I don't know if what they dismissed were applications like that. That could put a, a wrench in a lot of the patent attorneys that I know and how we try to get people's names out there nationally and not just be a statewide brand. So I'm going to throw this back at you guys. Now, Luke, I know that you just started a brand, so you probably can deal with some of this stuff. I'm interested to see what your experience is. But get a good trademark a lawyer if you're going to have a trademark. I'm throwing it back at you guys. What do you have to say? I mean, trademark, I mean, like, I'm so glad that you differentiated the difference between the need for state versus federal because federal is kind of like yeah. a joke for mm -hmm. cannabis businesses right now, right? Um, but it's, it's so critical, right? Because your, your brand is everything right now. And so if you, I mean, Dale, geez, like you should have a list of trademark attorneys in your pocket. I just sent you a text message, actually. I'm curious to know who you would recommend. Um, and it's really, it's incredibly important, especially in this day and age that if you are not documenting the nature of your business from a visual standpoint, from, from a name standpoint, you're just shooting yourself in the foot because there's only so many clever words that can tie to this plant, mm -hmm. right? Like there's only so many plays on words that you can come up with and you have to be able to protect it in some manner. Mm. Now, well, in trade dress is a lot of this, Mandy is that it's not just the word, is it what are the colors surrounding it, the patterns around it, and are you trying to take somebody else's color scheme and patterns and appropriate that? That typically gets done in the patent office and through their trial. They, they call them iterations. You'll make an application and say, no, this is, the color you're using is too close to some other color. you got to do another color. You do another application, and they, they make their way through this. That, I think needs to stay at the patent office, but that's my opinion. And and I do have names of some attorneys. If people want to contact me, I can put you in touch with some patent and trademark attorneys. Um, okay. Uh, so, I, you know, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up, Dale, because Nick in the chat, he's like, they don't capitalize the letters like raw and the color scheme is completely different as well. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I personally agree with that. Like they don't have a, a patent or a trademark on the word raw. I mean, if that's the case, they should be suing like Whole Foods and all these other raw food restaurants and everything. Oh, but that's one of the. Isn't there a component of how how the brand is used too? Um, like it has to be somewhat related. So, uh, are are those are raw papers? They're not actually sold as cannabis paraphernalia, right? Because that would still be federally illegal. They're sold as tobacco paraphernalia. Is that sold right? As tobacco paraphernalia. Yeah, paraphernalia. they have a tobacco exception for it. Yeah. Real quick, Dale. I got, like funny, I, got... I was just. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, man. 
I was just saying, Luke and I were just saying the other day that we didn't remember. We were like, oh, whatever happened to Raw? Like, they just mm -hmm. disappeared for a minute. And here they are. They're back. They're back. Back, <laughs> back with another lawsuit. They've been they've been tied up in litigation for, like, the past two years. Yeah, they've been tied <laughs> down more like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, know, um, I, I think when I got out, the, you guys covered my story and Raw's story, I think, on the same day or something like that. I, I remember the, the Raw thing circulating right around when I got out around February last year a lot, too. Um, but I have a question for you, Dale, real quick. I know there is a standard or threshold on like what can be trademarked. Like there, I, I read a case about like somebody was trying to trademark the word the, oh, it was Ohio state. It was Ohio state was trying to trademark the word the Ohio state. Right. And they were trying to make it to where nobody else could use it. And the court said, listen, that's just too common the, the word has too many common uses. I think they they was the standard that they used. But maybe you can talk more to that, Dale. Is there something that where you, something is such a simple or 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 a commonly used term that they can't trademark? There absolutely is, and the attorneys I work with want a unique word, mm -hmm. something like Shazam or something like that that Super doesn't have common use, but okay, that you can actually capture that. Because there are so many common words. That's the first discussion that takes place with these patent attorneys. They take a look at your proposed trademark and goes, look, this name you can't patent or you can't trademark. Mm -hmm. That word you can't because they're just too common. And at the trademark office, they will take a look at their list of all the similar names and see, are you close? And that's part of the iteration process. They go, you know, that's too close to this one. Change a word here. Different spell it. Mm -hmm. Change the trade dress around it, something like that. And if the attorneys lose this, I don't know what that's going to mean. So, yeah, it, it's a problem. I don't know how to how to address that, Luke, because I mean, there's so many common words. <clears throat> Yeah, right. the, the, I mean, like, let, let's look at what the most popular brands are, though, right? Like, they're companies like Nike, Adidas, what, uh, Amazon, words that are not necessarily, like, yes, they are words that have meaning historically or, or geographically or whatever, but they're not words that are necessarily used in common vernacular, right? So, well, Amazon know, is. That would be Amazon is. I mean, it is now because of the company. It is now, yeah. Prior, I, I, but I'd say it that. is because everyone talks about saving the rainforest. <laughs> or Google, for example, is another mm -hmm. one that yes, it has some meaning, but you know it it's not really used out until until it was adopted by by a company. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always been my view on that. I'm not necessarily a marketing person, but I feel like using names that are not likely to be used again, or um, where it's very obvious that somebody is ripping off your name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know, man. Um... You know, one could argue, I'm not making the argument, but one could argue that uh, trademark law in itself stifles uh, creativity and stifles uh, uh, stifles progress. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's baked into our Constitution. Yeah, I, you, I they have I intellectual I'm property right. I see. I see. I'm not personally making the argument. But I mean, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the free market. Why, I'm yeah, all for it, but uh, I think... Is, is the reason why China, without IP and without a patent law, China has blazed past the rest of the world in less than three decades because of their lack of uh, patent and IP mm -hmm. law. Cute. Did you not make that argument? Cute. 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 Just saying. No. Yeah. Just, because they're know, just thieves. They, it, they just because... steal it. Yes. yes. They just steal yeah. all of our shit. Well, the, the so world no. is all about well, you, you can argue that uh, the progress over humanity um, uh, several times over is all about stealing other people's shit, reproducing right. it and selling it as your own. Well, yeah. but when you get caught, you shouldn't get away with it. This is my thing. This is this is like this is what my little piece of advice that I will just drop on this conversation. And you can pick it up or leave it or drop it and throw it in the trash. I don't know. But. Okay, let's say we start this brand called Mandy Tingler, right? And the brand is called Mandy Tingler, and it's doing well. And then, doesn't have to be Tingler. <laughs> and then another brand Ooh. comes up, right? And it's called Mandy Tingler too, because they want to capitalize and try to bootleg and make money mm -hmm. off of off of that brand's name, right? Bootleg it, baby. But, Go ahead. But this is the difference at least in the cannabis space, right? A lot of things don't transfer from the corporate world into the cannabis industry, and some of it does, but this is, I think, one of the spots where it doesn't, is in the cannabis space, 
people know Mandy. People know the authenticity of Mandy's brand. They know what she put into it. They know her work. They know her story behind it. They know all these things. They know what kind of care goes into it. They know Mandy's expertise in the, in the market. They know she's a cannabis connoisseur. They see the other brand too. They know that's not Mandy's brand, or even if they do, they say that's suspect, right? What's going on over there? Mm -hmm. This is my point is that authenticity matters in the cannabis space. <laughs> so your brand, regardless of it, I'm gonna go over to Mandy Tingler's real brand because it auras with the authenticity of her stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in, in a different space, in a apparel space, right? A Nike, black Nike t-shirt with the Nike symbol on it, right? Is a black Nike t-shirt with the Nike symbol on it, no matter where I get it from, the docks in San Francisco or from the Nike outlet in Gilroy. Mm -hmm. It really is the same thing to me. There's not an authenticity to it that I have to say. I mean, there's an authenticity to it, of course, but of, of a shirt versus a bootleg, but there's not some like, exp like I'm not going to that brand and saying, oh, like I know this brand, I know this person, I know what goes into this. Like none of that happens when I'm doing that. That's where I'm saying that it doesn't transfer. So my point is this, is people could bootleg, people could take your brand, they can say it and they can call anything, anything they want to. But if you represent your brand and your company in a way that nobody else can and bring that authenticity, guess what? Nobody can dub that. Yep. Nobody can. Yep. And, uh, and, and, and on, on one thing, uh, I do want to give a shout out to Adam who knew what Nike meant because I had no clue what yeah, Nike meant. Greek, Greek it's goddess, a Greek, word. Greek goddess of victory. Shout out Adam throwing that in the chat. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, that. Right. Right. We, 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 we got to go to a commercial. Is thrown out you know as an option for almost every women owned brand ever. Yeah, we got to go to a commercial. We're going to be right back. <laughs> The control tower from Highly Educated has perfected the dab. Utilizing the concept of thin film evaporation, you can waste none of it and taste all of it. The micro texture of the SE pillar increases nucleation at elevated temperatures. And with the tower propelling at 2600 RPMs, it's certainly the most efficient dab experience to date. The control tower from Highly Educated. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I was hold, gonna hold, tell you. Hold on, stop, hold on, hold on, Mandy. Hold on a second. Stop whatever you're doing. Make sure you hit that like button. Mm -hmm. Also, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you've not subscribed already. And all of the articles that we cover on today's show, you can read directly on our website at www.hyatt9news.com. And thank you so much to Miss Ingrid Fay with the super chat, who says, "Here's to the Mandy Tingler show, you guys. Here's yeah. to the Mandy Tingler show. Thank you so much, Ingrid." I'm Jason Beck, and this is Smoky Vanilla, and if you want to feel as good as I look, then you need to get a stretch and smoke with Smoky Vanilla. Hi, I'm Smoky Vanilla. I have my bachelor's degree in kinesiology, and I'm a sports massage therapist and stretch coach. I focus mostly on individuals that are in sport with chronic pain or injury. I love to intuitively create a, and customize a session based on the individual that I'm working with. We'll go over a few postural assessments, work together to create a wellness journey based on the health history, past injuries, or anything still affecting you today. And we'll get you back on your feet right away with less pain. Me. We're about to stretch and then we're gonna smoke because we're gonna get on our stretch and smoke. Me. If you want to feel as good as I look, then you need to come on down and get a stretch and smoke with none other than Smoky Vanilla. Yee. Yeah, Jason, look at uh, very, yeah. very, very, very different. Yeah. <laughs> it's one. the most awkward commercial we have, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm all for the awkwardness. I'm all for the awkwardness. But up next, we got a dope dad, author, activist, entrepreneur, OG, trailblazer, warrior for justice, and spitter of truth coming to the stage. Y'all know who it is. It's Hyatt Nine News' friendly outlaw expert, Nick Scarmazzo. What you got for us today, my man? Woo. Man, today is a doozy. We're coming to you live and direct from, you know, Modesto, California. It's your local outlaw correspondent reporting for Hyatt Nine News. I got a really, uh, this one is not even, I'm not even going to play with this one because it's, this one is super sad. I'm just going to, I'm going to read it and we'll talk about it. 
but we'll just get right to it. Ex-property agent sentenced to death for cannabis trafficking. As judge re rejects his defense, the drugs were for research. He argued that the drugs were tied to potential plans for a business venture, but the judge dismisses claims as concocted afterthought. Singapore. A former property agent was sentenced to a mandatory death penalty for trafficking cannabis, with the judge rejecting his claims that the drugs were for research and development. The judge, the judge issued the judgment issued by Judge C. Key Ong of the Appellate Division on Tuesday, April 2nd, outlined the reasons for the conviction of Si Pong Jing in one charge of having no less than 4,500 grams of cannabis mixture for trafficking. Si, formerly a property sales agent with the Hudson Asia, was, re was arrested on June 28, 2018, after Central Narcotics Bureau officers seized five blocks of a vegetable matter from his car. The blocks were analyzed and contained no less than 4,509.2 grams of cannabis mixture, referred to by seat as weed. Two mobile phones belonging to seat were also sent for a forensic examination and found to contain mass me sent messages advertising the drug. Seat's defense in the cannabis case. Seat then, 28 years old, claimed, tri claimed trial to charge, I don't know what, they, they didn't really do that, right? Which carried, went to trial, and which carried a charge of a mandatory death penalty. He was legally represented by lawyers from Andre Jacomboy LLC and Sterling Law Corporation. The, law, the lawyers argued that their client intended to use the drug for research and development for a business rather than trafficking. They claim that Seat developed a fascination with cannabis, not just for consumption, but also for its cultivation and potential uses of cannabidol and the an ingredient derived from cannabis. He had consulted several contacts beginning from March 2018 regarding the po possibility of starting a cannabis-related business. The defense also relied on the psychiatric report that Seat had been suffering from a drug-induced hypomanic episode, which contributed significantly to his reckless and impulsive behavior at the material time, as he was using the drugs for extraction of the cannabidol oil as part of his grandos plans to set up a cannabis business. However, the prosecution contends that the defense was a mere afterthought and inconsistent with other evidence. It also argued that Seat did not fulfill the diagnostic requirement for substance-induced hypomanic disorder. Judge dismisses claims of as concocted afterthought. Judge C found that Seat had failed to prove the defense of research and describing it as a concocted afterthought. He referred to Seat's statement to the authorities post arrest, noting that the absence of any mention of research until the trial phase. The judge also referenced a portion of the statement made by C the day of the arrest, where the accused said that the cannabis mixture was meant to help damage friends who need help and a sense of belonging and then give them a sense of security. Seat's subsequent statements, including one made a month later detailing his pricing strategy for selling weed, which he said depended on his friend's financial abilities, did not mention research, noted Justice Seat. Despite Seat's effusive claims of enthusiasm about his new research and development business venture, Seat evidently did not possess the know-how and had no plans to extract cannabidol from the drug. The judge noted that Seat had believed it was only a matter of time before cannabis was legalized in Singapore. Seat had also been in touch with contacts about business ventures overseas. However, the discussions were very vague and concerned, and concerned big dreams that would have only be pursued if cannabis were legalized in Singapore. Judge Seat acknowledged that Seat's evidence does suggest that he was a cannabis enthusiast, noting that not only was he not only an, an enthusiastic cannabis consumer, but he had a he was keen to explore the prospects of starting a cannabis-related business in Singapore. However, the judge described his plans as vague, nebulous, and ultimately undeveloped. 
Given the range of scattershot and unfocused ideas that C had, and the fact that some of his ideas did not even have anything to do with Singapore, I find it difficult to believe that C had any concrete ideas or plans for research and development, including the production and or extraction of cannabidol in Singapore that he could work with and was ready to act on, much less specifically in relation to the drugs, he said. Any such ideas or plans only existed in his imagination. Nothing translated be, be beyond mere talk into action. Um, judge, that's how businesses are started. They start as ideas, then people implement them and, and speak them into the or speak them into the universe, then take actions to implement them. And that's how businesses are created. That's how our industry was created, really similar to this, with people taking chances and, to, and opening cannabis businesses and extracting cannabinoids and all these really vague and nebulous, crazy things that they're talking about here. But I really want to talk about this. This man is 28 years or he was 28 years old in 2018 so what what's that make him now it was 34 so he this man is 34 years old he is going to be put to death for having five bricks of weed he's going to be put to death for having five bricks of weed because he wanted to start a cannabis business in singapore mm -hmm. i don't know like what we have to say as a community, what we have to boycott, if we have to say we're not spending any money with Singapore, or if we have to say we're not gonna buy a product that's made in Singapore or anything as an industry or as a community, I'm saying that right now it should happen. Because this man is going to be put to death for having weed, period. That is not cool. That is beyond not cool. <laughs> This is a tragedy. This is something that needs to stop. I cannot believe in 2024, in the world, we are still putting people to death for cannabis and then doing business with them as an American government. We need to stop that. Yeah, man, oh man, yeah. oh man, this is a sad story, Luke. Yeah, unfortunately, sure. Singapore is still one of those places like Saudi Arabia, like mm -hmm. Iran, there's a handful of places that you absolutely do not want to get caught with cannabis yeah. in the world. Even, this is what even the do. UAE, even the UAE, there was someone, yeah. there the was UAE, someone that got Dubai. That... I mean, a oh. lot of these countries are known for their impractical laws and their extremism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Singapore is... executed a man less than a year ago. Uh, he was a man of Indian descent who was a yeah. Singaporean man. Um, uh, he was 46 years old. They executed him for 2.2 pounds of marijuana. Um, yep. And this that was April of last year, less than a year ago. So this is um, what do pounds go unfortunately for just uh, uh, what was that, Jason? What do pounds go for in Singapore? They got to be expensive as fuck because you're risking life for it. That's that, 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 that's, that, that's exactly that's exactly part of my thought. That's exactly part of my thought. Like, man, like the risk versus reward. I'm not sure if that if that if that all equates uh, for to, to be there with that. Yeah. I wonder, did he, I wonder if this guy good. had some insight about uh, law changes coming in Singapore because that's, like, like you said, quite a risk to take. And, mm -hmm. you know, his defense is that he was doing R&D for, you know, anticipating legalization in Singapore. So I'm curious uh, what, what information he was operating on yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, I think the bold statement that no one should be even in prison for pot, let alone being killed, should be the start of our conversation here, because this is absolutely insane. But you're right. There are places where they don't hesitate whacking your head off yep. or things that we consider to be, you know, maybe you get a, some jail time for that. But the now, difference is, the difference is, Dale, the 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 most of those countries that so hum named with the exception of saudi arabia and we know all why that is um we don't we don't have relationships with them or we don't do business with them or we're at least not sitting on the un table with them <clears throat> here i think with singapore not only do we do a ton of business with them we have travel there we we have singaporean citizens here uh tick tock is owned by a, a Singaporean citizen. No, 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 no. The CEO is 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 he's a Singapore. CEO, yeah, yeah he's the CEO. CEO. Excuse he's me. Not yeah, you're right. Not owner. CEO. Yeah. yeah, it's owned by China. Well, but the problem, Luke, is that we see this as a major issue, and at the UN, they're still fighting about the 61 Convention about whether it should be legal. And there's places where they don't really care. They'll whack people for all kinds of things. So for us, this is like 
no, this should never happen because you and I went to prison for weed. That should never have happened either. You should never kill somebody for this. That should be reserved for people who are violent criminals or not. There's no hope for them. But I don't know that this gets the traction at places where it makes a difference. Um, and that's the frustrating part of all of this. You know, yeah, I think doctor, the one thing is like there there might be some hope too because if you remember maybe ten years ago, Thailand was in that group of of countries that had extremely extremely strict punishment for even the smallest amount of possession of cannabis. And I mean, I was personally shocked when when they approved adult use and started opening up dispensaries. But I don't know. For me, that's maybe a glimmer of hope. But you're you're absolutely right. Nobody well, nobody deserves to die for possession or or really well, anything we, to do with cannabis we, we we have dr mark in in the chat and dr mark is like if it was cannabidiol he was after it was probably low thc hemp right and that very well could be possibly the case that that, that it, it was uh hemp, hemp derived because they don't have that arbitrary point three it's all weed to them in singapore regardless of what the what the percentage base is but uh, i guess we're going to find out we're going to go to a commercial we're going to be right back Get ready for the return of the shit show to Los Angeles, returning Friday, May 3rd, 7 p.m. to midnight at a brand new venue. Comedy sets by comedians such as Demi York, Lindsay Ames, Alyssa Phillips, Chris Thayer, Josh Shakespeare, Fumi Abi, Jay Snow, Brent Weinbach, Chris Kelly, and hosted by none other than Abdullah Saeed. So head over to www.cloudmedia.partners now to get your tickets, and we'll see you there. Ah, oh, yes. Coming up next, she's a mom. She's a. She has cannabis brands and, oh, man, so, so, so much more. She also just held the Women's Can Awards, which was an amazing success just this past weekend, which we were fortunate enough to attend. And there is a full live stream of the award ceremony on our YouTube page that you should definitely check out. Coming up next, it is none other than Miss Mandy Tingler. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Jason and Adam from the Hyatt Nine crew for... Uh, being there at the Women's Canna Awards and streaming live for us. And thank you, Rico, for coming and, and being a sponsor of our event as well with Happy Cabbage. Um, I really felt the love from this team and I appreciate it. And Luke, thank you so much for all the help that you gave throughout the entire process. A lot of it was just wiping my tears, but, <laughs> but I appreciate it. And, um, you know, to my amazing team of chair women, my goodness, uh, Grace and Candace and Amber and Chastity and Danny and Jessica and Fanny and um, just all of the ladies who came before them um, who didn't get to quite cross the finish line with us. Thank you. I appreciate all of the hard work that you did. I, the compliments from our event have not stopped. They continue to roll in even this morning, like four mm -hmm. days later. So I love it. Killed it. On that note, I have a story for you guys with a little bit of a sad twist, but a wonderful reflection on our dear cannabis friend and pioneer, John Sinclair. A headline reads, Marijuana Activist and Detroit's Residential Radical, John Sinclair has died at age 82. A champion of legal marijuana counterculture, a hero and poet, John Sinclair, passed on Tuesday morning at age 82. Sinclair was an influential advocate who is best known for his fight toward legalizing marijuana and for his role as a band manager for the MC5. The Davidson native was also a champion of civil rights and co-founder of the radical anti-racist group, the White Panther Party. Sinclair was famously arrested for felony possession of two joints in the late 1860s and sentenced to 10 years in prison. The arrest sentence galvanized counterculture activists and many came to his defense with a 1971 freedom rally <clears throat> at Ann Arbor's Chrysler Arena, headlined by John Lennon and Oyoko Ono with performances by Bob Seger and Stevie Wonder. The 14-hour event drew 15,000 people, and Sinclair was released from prison in Jackson three days later after serving fewer than three years. Lennon, who'd been arrested for marijuana possession himself, wrote a song for Sinclair, which appears on the John Lennon and Yoko Ono album called Sometime in New York City, released in 1972. 
If the song lyrics read, they gave him 10 for two. What else can Judge Columbo do? We gotta set him free, John, Le John Lennon's lyrics say. The song John Sinclair was covered by 1990s rock band Blind Melon, which may have exposed a new generation of pot activists to Sinclair, including former hash banger organizer Nicholas Zettel, who heard the song at age 44. His dad took him to hear Sinclair speak in, prison, in person a year later. It was a very inspirational event in my life that led me to passionately pursue cannabis legalization activism. Something about the injustice of his story lit a fire in me, he said. He was also inspired to go to school in Ann Arbor after learning about the hash bash and Michigan's medical and legal cannabis movement. I want to keep the, the radical spirit thriving. I and many others owe a lot to John and his righteous ways. In Detroit News interview in 2021 on the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rally for Sinclair, the activist said he was surprised it took Michigan so long to legalize marijuana. Truth prevailed, he said. People didn't quit using it, you see, and more people got on the side of the felons, and pretty soon they had to remove the felony. It just didn't make any sense. Sinclair had been living in the Cass Corridor in recent years. He was able to see marijuana not only be legalized in his home state, but become available. Dispensaries would now dot the entire landscape from county to county. He thought it was great, he would say. We finally got the squares to come around, he would say. Hmm. He was definitely on the cutting edge of counterculture and on the uh, definitely Detroit's resident radical. The Claire was scheduled to speak on Saturday at the Ann Arbor Hash Bash, a rally and festival that's held at noon the first Saturday of April on the University of Michigan. The first Hash Bash happened in 1972, just months after Sinclair's historic Freedom Rally. Instead, this Saturday's 53rd annual Hash Bash will particularly be a de facto remembrance for Sinclair. Even coordinator Jamie Lowell said there would be there's already a portion of the bash earmarked to pay homage to other legalization activists who recently died, including Rick Thompson, Brad Lameek, Gersh Avery, and Rory Gold. Several politicians and cannabis activists, including John's wife, photographer Lenny Sinclair, are scheduled to speak. He and Lenny Sinclair, in my mind, they kind of kicked off the modern movement that led us to where we are now in Michigan. It's taken tens of thousand people over de de over decades to get here, said Lowell, adding that he was grateful for, Sin for Sinclair to be able to speak at the hash bash in 2023 in spite of bad weather. He decided to stick it out and offer up his wisdom to us anyway, and he did. People really, really appreciated it. It was very special. A lot of people were there for the first time, so to hit a hash bash and get an address from John Sinclair was pretty cool. Sinclair leaves behind a huge body of work in the form of books and recorded poems and essays backed by blues and jazz musicians. Last book, Collected Poems from 1964 to 2024, is currently at the printer set to be released next week by Lieber at Ridgeway Press. John Sinclair was my hero and poet in my youth. And he became my good friend, said Lieber. Sinclair is survived by his daughters, Celia Sinclair and Sonny Sinclair, granddaughter, Beyonce, and his ex-wife, Lenny Sinclair. You guys, we just lost a good one, a real good one. Can't wait to hear what all of you guys think about Mr. Sinclair and his impact on our industry. And it back at you. Yeah. Super sad. Two sad stories in a row, man. Yeah, uh, man, yeah, if I could put one in the air for old Johnny boy, I'd do it right now, man. Well, you can't. Uh, if you have one, if you didn't drop it in the water. No, I can't. Not can't for that, about, uh, four more years. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Like Biden? Just like Biden. Just like Biden. When <laughs> oh, Biden, God. Matter of fact, when I, when I get off federal probation, me and Biden are going to smoke. Fair enough. Ooh, Fair enough. Smoke. I'm not going there. I'm not going to go there. Mean Hunter? Gonna you're going to smoke that Sleepy Joe. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, this, this is super super sad story. I, I, and I like what 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 Nick said uh, in, in the comments uh, section. He says he says I bet Rory was just waiting to meet him with a big bowl of hash. 
And, uh, you know, Rory Gold was a big, oh, big activist. That's sweet. Yeah. So uh, I like that, Nick. We I do. like that a lot. You know, this is going to be a really um, emotional hash bash. Mm -hmm. The Michigan crew out there that's been a part of this with him for decades now is definitely feeling it. I know that a lot of my friends who are out there that have been along his side for the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, um, they're heartbroken. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how about my man still doing the, still doing the hash bash at 82 though, scheduled to still do it this year. Yeah. Like, man, that's all, man. Still grinding and getting it at 82 years old. I totally, totally, totally Honestly, agree. Because it's a love, right? When mm -hmm. you, when you fall in love with something, when you truly fall in love with something, like we have all fallen in love with this plant it becomes a piece of your fiber. You can't move on without it. it you don't go somewhere without it. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how old you are. They'll have Pebbles Trippet who comes out in her wheelchair mm -hmm. to events yep. with her caretaker mm -hmm. and speaks. Yep. Right. So like, An LV too. Yep. Yeah. It never, yep. it, it never leaves you. It doesn't matter. And a matter of fact, I bet you that at 82, it's what motivates you still. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, most definitely. And I make sure to, yeah. I want to make sure that we uh, close out the show today, Rico, in the memory of John Sinclair. And uh, and I just feel like, man, we just need to say, you know, weed for the people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, that's Thank all, you, that's all and um, respect and, and prayers to all the elders of the community that have passed. Yeah, and thoughts and <laughs> prayers to all the families, to all their family members as well that are that are dealing with this tough death. Yes. You ready, Rico? We got so hum. Let's do it. All right. So up next, he's got over a decade of cannabis tech and data experience under his belt, and he's um, reporting out of the great purple state of Texas. It's really red. Steadily on his grind, working on a lifestyle brand uh, for serious and professional athletes. The same damn name. Y'all know who it is. So hum. Stop. With the thank you thank you rico yeah and uh Definitely. just for for jason you know reporting out of the great blue city of austin oh, Travis County. yeah <laughs> uh, but i got i got a little bit uh yeah, something some a little news. bit more cheerful than, than the last couple stories uh washington dc although they have yet again failed to allow the the opening of adult use shops their city council just approved a tax holiday on 420, our high holiday coming up in a couple weeks here. Mm -hmm. um, so leaders in Washington, D.C. have approved legislation to suspend taxes on medical marijuana around the 420 celebration, declaring a tax holiday on purchases from April 15th through April 28th. The district council approved the tax holiday unanimously on a voice vote on Tuesday, also taking action on another a number of other cannabis related proposals, such as a proposed dispensary buffer zone around schools in commercial and industrial zones. The popular tax holiday is critical to the district's effort to attract qualifying patients back to the legal market, as well as sustainable and viable medical cannabis programs, said council member. Kenyon McDuffie, an independent, who introduced the measure on behalf of Mayor uh, Muriel uh, Bowser, who's a Democrat. The legislation also extends the period of validity for medical marijuana patient and caregiver registration cards to six years and clarifies the Alcoholic Beverage and Cannabis Administration, or ABCA, authority to close down unlicensed and unregulated retailers. The change authorizes ABCA to summarily close an unlicensed retailer where the where the continued operations of the un unlicensed retailer presents an imminent danger to the health, safety, or welfare of the public, according to a letter from uh, to the council from Mayor Bowser. An amendment also adopted unanimously by the council adjusted language in an effort to ensure the ABCA has the ability to investigate licensed medical marijuana businesses. Uh, prior uh, medical holiday was included in the 2020 bill designed to help address rising cannabis costs at licensed dispensaries and combat the continued threat posed by illicit cannabis storefronts and delivery services. Members of the panel said roughly 200 unlicensed dispensaries currently exist in the district and about 70 of those have applied to transition into the regulated market. Um, that's most of it, the article uh, talks a little bit more about some of the other proposals that, that were included and voted on. Um, but yeah, thanks again to Ben, Ad ben Adlin from Marijuana Moment for covering this. Uh, you know, I think it's great that they have created a tax holiday around 420. Uh, I, I think it's funny that they've 
openly stated that their whole goal is to combat the illicit market, but their answer to that is a temporary five-day tax holiday and not, uh, you know, permanently addressing that problem. But uh, yeah, I want let's hear what the rest of the the correspondents have to say. This is Soham with Hyatt Nine News out of Austin, Texas. Man, this makes me just say I wish 420 was every day, Soham. I don't believe that they should be taxing medical cannabis at all for any reason whatsoever at all. And that goes for every state, not just not just the uh, District of Columbia. But that's that, that that's for everybody when it comes to medical purchases. Mm-hmm. I agree Absolutely. on that. Yeah, we'll see. I'm we'll curious see. to see if this is going to increase their market, because mm-hmm. if it does, it should be a you know a bell gl- going off inside these idiots' heads. Well, you that know, we tax and regulate the shit out of this, and maybe you want to compete with the black market, you stop doing that. You know how to tell, Dale. You know how to tell. You just watch Maryland's numbers on 420 and see if they go up or down. I think one yeah. one good thing that, that was pointed out in this article, too, that's not necessarily related to the tax holiday itself, but the fact they stated they have 200 unlicensed uh, stores with 70 of them that are trying to transition into the regulated market. So I I will say shout out to to the District of Columbia for doing what they can to help legacy operators transition into the regulated market and not just shutting them down and barring them from from ever participating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point actually that you make so long because that's I think a totally different mentality than just shut you down and and have a law enforcement situation happen rather than hey look you're in this market already let's get you into the legal market so that we can get the tax revenue to be able to improve schools and roads in the community yeah. hmm. and okay. and address public safety you know get your products right. tested and such exactly uh, i hope uh, i hope those regulators in uh in the great state of new york are are taking notes on on at least that aspect of the program cuz they should they should try that mm mm-hmm. mhm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. You're giving them too much credit, so um, I agree. <laughs> They're dumb as a box I said, of I hope. I said I hope, not that I think. I mean, I, I have another yeah. question, like a logistical question, um, because in D.C. you can self-certify. So, I mean, can't you just walk up and just acknowledge yourself <laughs> as a patient and then therefore be able to uh, get this tax break? I think you still have to register as a patient because they said they also passed a, a measure to extend those registration cards for six years. So you might be able to self-certify, but you still have to file, I think, some type of registration and get, a, get, a, get an actual medical or a caregiver card. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, then you lose your gun rights. Oh, no. Yep. So not, not, go not ahead after, sign up. Not after my story, you're not going to lose your gun rights. <laughs> I mean, there's probably not as many places that you can legally carry in D.C. anyway. I mean, it all depends on how you carry so hum. But you can steal as many cars as you want. Yeah. It's not Maybe. New Jersey. In D.C., they don't chase you down <laughs> if you steal a car. Well, no car I mean, they used car. to have duels. They used to have duels right out on the mall out there and mm-hmm. shoot at each other and shit. I mean, if, you, if you've ever driven in D.C., I mean, D.C. is a crazy, crazy place to drive just be, with the, 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 the layout of it is just The insane. traffic? Yeah, the, yeah. I'm not talking the, about the, the hood. I'm talking about and, lawmakers. Didn't Aaron Burr and Hamilton shoot yeah. at each other right in front of the Yeah, Aaron, Aaron Burr murdered Hamilton. Oh, yeah. boy. Yep. Oh, yep. boy. Oh, boy. And, and anti-cannabis uh, lawmakers out of uh, Maryland. A uh, dude tried to show up to Congress with a gun in his pocket, too. Mm-hmm. Rico, Rico, also, too, on a, on, on a separate note, um, uh, you know how you like to give the last word of the day to someone? Oh, yeah. We have a video queued up, so we want to give the last word to Mr. John yeah. Sinclair today. Uh, okay, I'll like definitely it. do that, man. But um, yeah, thank you all for joining us for yet another episode of High at Nine News. You can catch us live weekdays, 9 a.m. Pacific, high noon on the East Coast. Big shout out to our super fans, Ingrid Faye in the building today. Cool oh, yeah. Ingrid. Thank you, oh, Ingrid. Big Ingrid. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, man. oh so, sorry. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. Big shout out to super fans showing love, getting their comments posted live on the big screen as well. Um, and also the audience and all my more than fifteen dollars on tax. What was that? No taxes. Mm-hmm. Online tax. supporters catch us across all media platforms, tuning in each day to the headlines of chaos, also known as the development cannabis industry. To our vetted correspondent team tuning in from all over, bringing us much needed variety of perspective and your respected opinions to the table. Our production team, cloud media partners, all the sponsors keeping our lights on and our AV struggles to a minimum. Big shout out to Adam holding things down in the background oh, there, yeah. helping me out with my. Um, 
you know, I, 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 he helped me out with the, the blurriness earlier because you know what? He's an expert in getting the feathers out. Oh, mm. cute, cute, cute. <laughs> As always, Cannabis CTV, the reason we show up to read these stories every single day. Thank you, too. It has been Wednesday, April 3rd. 2024 the show's over you've all been blessed with the top industry headlines hope it is enough for you to put in your pipe and smoke at least until tomorrow i'm rico let me the dopest dad on the street for hyatt nine news cannabis industry's number one daily news show and um special outro today let's run that tape. let's let's run it Rest in Big peace, love, Mr. John Sinclair. All right, y'all. Got to dip. Peace, homies. Peace, brothers. Have a great day.